could you kind of detail out those seven steps and why each of those steps exist in, in the way that you've shared them? Yeah, so it starts with what we call navigating the narrative. And that's really getting clear with your own feelings about speaking up. Because one of the things that we would hear in, in, the, in the research is people would say, well, my, my boss doesn't. My boss is scared. My boss is playing this political game. They're telling me it's safe to speak up, but I don't see her or him doing it. So I'm not going to either. So navigating the narrative is really thinking about your experiences with speaking up and do you feel confident? And if you and one of the ways we encourage people to do that is to think back on their career and there are moments where they felt like they were a bit courageous, where they spoke up because, and what happened? Because um, Dr. Amy Edmondson of Harvard, uh, who wrote the foreword to Courageous Cultures, she's really considered to be the pioneer of psychological safety. And one of the things that she really focuses on is that people are more likely to hold on to a negative experience with speaking up than a positive one. Mm, for sure. And why that's so important is even if you are a very human centered leader that you really want people's ideas, it's statistically likely that there are people on your team who have had a negative experience with, in the past with speaking up who are afraid, even though that you have done nothing to engender that fear. Right. So that's, uh, so that's step one, navigating the narrative. And then it's uh, the next couple are uh, creating clarity. And this is clarity about two things. One, being really clear that you do want people's ideas. But most importantly, clarity around what a good idea would accomplish. It's so interesting. A lot of times when um, people will call us and say, you know, my team is just, they're not thinking critically. I don't know what's wrong with them. What can you do? Can you give them some critical thinking training? And when I get underneath to what's really going on there, it's not that they don't know how to think critically. It's that they don't have enough strategic context to bring forward good ideas. Mm. So part of creating clarity is here's where we're headed strategically. This is what's most important. This is why it's important. So then people have the context to say, oh, I have an idea about that. And then, so it's navigating the narrative, two is creating clarity, and then it's cultivating curiosity. So as I mentioned in the research, 49% said they're not regularly asked for their ideas. Well, and then when we got into the qualitative aspect of that research, uh, the managers would say, well, I have an open door policy. People know that. The problem with an open door is that it's passive and it still takes some courage for people to walk through that open door. Right. So cultivating curiosity is proactively going out and asking people for their ideas. And one of the ways that we recommend you do that is to ask what we call a courageous question. Now, a courageous question is different than a just, oh, how do you think we should do better question in a couple of ways? It's right. specific. And it's humble. It assumes that improvement is possible. So for example, what's one way you think we could improve the productivity of this process? What's one way I could improve our communication on our team? What's one way we could make our meetings more effective? Those kinds of questions are more easy to answer. They take less courage than to say, do you have any ideas about how I can improve my leadership? You know, if you say that, that feels intimidating to people. Or do you have any ideas of how we could be, get better results? That's just, it's so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It can be very specific. We have found that that is very inviting for people. And then the fourth step is responding with regard. And this is how you respond to an idea, even if it's an idea that you can't use. Mm. And so we recommend you respond with gratitude, thanking them for contributing, not necessarily for the exact idea. Thank you for contributing. Thank you for thinking critically about the business. Then with information about what is or is not going to happen with the idea, and then an invitation to continue to contribute. So imagine someone uh, brings you an idea and you're headed in this direction, strategically, you're headed over here. And their idea is all about this direction, which is the exact opposite. It's what you might right. consider a dumb idea, right? So, but you still want them to be thinking critically and contributing in the future. So you say, thank you for thinking about the business. We're not going to use that idea right now because our most important priorities over here, this would change the direction and we, we don't have bandwidth to do that right now. And then an invitation, but if you have any ideas that would help us in this area and the strategic direction that we are headed, I'm all ears. 
So yeah. now you haven't shut the person down. You've still showed um, gratitude and an invitation, but you're also responding and saying you're not using it. So those are the first four steps. And those four, I think, are the most critical because those are ones that you can use whether you are leading a team of five people or whether you're trying to build an entire culture. And then the other ones are more about for, for big HR kinds of initiatives or you're the COO where you're wanting to then um, build an infrastructure for courage, where you're looking at your HR systems and processes. Because you know if those are counterintuitive, right? If you're saying, I want your ideas, but that's not what you're rewarding. If you're rewarding, this is the way we've always done it, then that's you know, uh, in conflict. And it's been interesting with some of our, our larger clients, we, don't, we not only go in and do leadership training, but we also look at their hiring practices, their recruiting practices, uh, their rewards and recognition, all of the things that, and, that build that infrastructure for courage. And then uh, it's also about practicing the principle, which is how do you scale your practices? So you've got a best practice here. Well, how do you then change it, um, keep the kernel of what's working there, but maybe the way you implement it in West Virginia is going to be different than in New York City. And how do you, you know, build those processes in place? Mm -hmm.